Turn with me, please, in your Bibles to Joshua chapter 1. Um, as the children make their way out for the children's, the children's sermon, let me just say uh, I, how good it was to take some time off and how good it is to be back with you this morning. And, and we, uh, Beth and I, uh, spent some time away in the mountains last week. And that, that's always good. We take that for granted and the beauty of that all around us for granted, don't we? Uh, it, it's, it's absolutely amazing. And uh, it just reminds me that one day there's going to be a new heaven and a new earth. And the Lord is going to establish Himself upon the whole of the earth. And He is going to be King and He is going to reign. And all that is broken is going to be right, made right. And everything that is... Uh, and, and, and every tear is going to be wiped away and all of our sorrows are going to be behind us and death will be no more. Um, it is just a, an amazing thing. Something, again, we, we take for granted in, in many ways. You know, most of us grew up um, in kind of a culturized Christianity. By that I mean we're all around us. You know, most people are Christians. I can remember the community I grew up in the few people that didn't go to church, you kind of knew they didn't go to church. You knew, and they, you know, there was, uh, and, and, and I, I, I'm sorry to say, there was probably a little bit of whispering about them. They, you know, they, you know, they don't go to church. You know, and 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 and, 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 and that kind of cultural Christianity. You know, almost everybody goes to church, and and almost everybody is involved in in uh, church in some form or fashion, in a cursor, cursory way at least go, you know, they, they attend and, and, and are part of that culture and that culturized Christianity. Um, in, in many ways, there were a lot of good things about that, but in a, in a lot of ways there can be some cha special challenges to that. Um, I know some of you didn't grow up in that. Uh, and, and, and there are some advantages have and that you don't take a lot of things for granted that some of us take for granted when it comes to just what it means to live in a Christian culture. But you know, one of the, the, the great one of the problems with growing up in that culturized Christianity is you um, you kind of tend to think that everything comes easy in the Christian life. I mean I grew up in a family and it was expected at some point Probably at a young age, I would become a Christian. And, and, the, and there are wonderful things about that, but there are not so good things about that because, I mean, it was just sort of expected. And it's almost like if you're not careful, you can just sort of merge into Christianity instead of being transformed into Christianity. You see the difference? There's a huge difference. That, that, that you can you can just sort of merge into it and, and not be born again necessarily, but you just kind of come into a lifestyle and a, and a way of life that's expected of you. And you go through the rituals and you go through baptism and you do all those things. Now I'm not saying that's what I did, but I'm saying that can happen very easily to you when you grow up in a culturized Christianity. And I, I think about my friend. Uh, my, the contrast between that and my friend Yaya, who is uh, a young man who lives in in West Africa, and Yaya was it was he grew up in a Muslim home, and he, his father was the imam in the village. I've told you a little bit about him before. He he his father the imam was the teacher of Islam, and uh, Yaya grew up in that. He grew up in a culturized. Islam, as a matter of fact, but that was expected of you. You're going to be you're going to be Islamic. You're going to go through the rituals of that. You're going to be a part of all of that. But as a young man, Yahya went to the capital city of the country where he lives, and there he met some IMB missionaries, International Mission Board missionaries, and they were teaching a translation class. And he already knew some English, and he knew that that might be a good way for him to get a job, so he went to the translation class. Uh, and, he, and, and there in the translation class, they taught the Bible. They taught English by using the Bible. And as he began to read the Bible and study the Bible, he came to the conclusion, this is true. This is true. And he made the, 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 he, he made the decision. 
He was called out of Islam and called into Christianity. And there was an absolute transformation for him. That, and, and so much so that his parents at first almost denounced him, put him out. They've since then kind of mended things and have at least peace among them. But not only that, but you know, when I was uh, when I was a young man, I felt called into ministry, as we say, called to preach, and I and that wasn't hard for me. It it again, it was something everybody around me applauded. Everybody thought this is wonderful that you you know, and there all these people gathered around me, and they were and, and they were encouraging to me, but not so for Yahya. He. Believe God was calling him to preach the gospel, not just, I mean, not, not just live it out, but preach it, tell others about Jesus. He, he and you know, he faced difficulty that I could not even imagine. Now, the, the thing is, in a culturized Christianity, we can forget that the Christian life is a battle, that, that it's warfare. And in some respects, it can almost become so easy for us that we, we, we don't realize, we don't understand, we're not prepared when the battles do come. Now what we're going to be studying about, a person we're going to be studying about these next few weeks is a person who was a warrior. And he knew what battle was like. He knew what it was like to battle for the Lord. And that is the man named Joshua. Now, Jeremy introduced the book of Joshua last week. He did a great job of kind of helping us to understand the context of Joshua in the whole of the Bible and how God's promises and God's covenant is, is just extended from Moses on to Joshua. But here we see in chapter 1 of the book of Joshua that the, the setting apart and the encouraging word that comes to the Lord... Uh, from, or comes to Joshua from the Lord as he is getting ready to lead the people of God into battle to take the promised land. Now, all often the uh, the, the book of Joshua has been a picture of the, the victory of the Christian life. <laughs> That, that you have the wandering in the wilderness and you can live a kind of a wandering wilderness kind of Christianity or you can live a victorious Christianity. Now, and, and that I think I think that's a far-fetched analogy there. That, that that you can you can wander in the wilderness, or you can go in and take the land. You can have the, you can be a conquering Christian, or you can live kind, kind of a wilderness Christianity that just sort of gets along, gets through life. Now, what we're called to here is a victorious Christianity. And I hope that we see that in these coming weeks. And I, I hope that we understand the importance of this as we look at the book of Joshua. And I'm going to ask you to read with me in Joshua chapter uh, 1, beginning with verse 1 through verse 11. After this, the death of Moses, the servant of the Lord, the, the Lord said to Joshua, the son of Nun, Moses' assistant, Moses, my servant, is dead. Now therefore arise and go over to this Jordan, you and all this people into the land that I am giving them, to the people of Israel. Every place that the sole of your foot will tread upon, I have given to you, just as I promised to Moses. From the wilderness and from this, Le from this Lebanon, as far as the great river, the river Euphrates, all the land of the Hittites, to the great sea toward the going down of the sun, shall be your territory. No man shall be able to stand before you all the days of your life. Just as I was with Moses, so I will be with you. I will not leave you or forsake you. Be strong and courageous, for you shall cause this people to inherit the land that I swore to their fathers to give them. Only be strong and very courageous, being careful to do according to all the law that Moses my servant commanded you. Do not turn from it to the right, hand or to the left, that you may have good success wherever you go. This book of the law shall not depart from your mouth, but you shall meditate on it day and night, so that you may be careful to do according to all that is written in it. 
For then you will make your way prosperous, and then you will have good success. Have I not commanded you? Be strong and courageous. Do not be frightened. And do not be dismayed. For the Lord your God is with you wherever you go. And Joshua commanded the officers of the people, pass through the midst of the camp and command the people, prepare your provisions. For within three days you are to pass over this Jordan to go in to take possession of the land that the Lord your God is giving you to possess. Now again, you can see very readily, can't you, why this is about victory. And what we're going to be talking about these next few weeks is, is walking in victory in the Christian life. And, 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 and you know, one of the things that, that happens uh, or to us, again, when, when we grow up in a, in a kind of culturized Christianity, is when difficulty comes, we're not necessarily ready for it. But Joshua was a seasoned, was a seasoned uh, warrior. And yet God speaks these words to him. These words of encouragement. He needed them and we need them. And we need them. I tell you, all around us folks, those of us who grew up in a culturized Christianity are seeing that sort of melt away, aren't we? The things that we have counted in the past, the things that we have maybe used the, 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 to encourage us, the numbers, the, 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 the things that, that are visible, uh, we, we don't necessarily see those like we once did, right? I and mean, everybody doesn't go to church. I would be very surprised if one-third of, of my neighbors today were in, in, in the subdivision which I live or in church. The numbers, of the, the numbers of people who say they go to church or attend church at all are, are, are going down at a staggering rate. A lot of the things that we have that have been visible signs of our victory, we thought in the past, are not there anymore. But the thing that is happening is that culturized Christianity is going away. And nominal Christianity is going away. And the, and, the, and the true warriors of God are standing strong in the, among the people of God. And that's what I hope we will see in these coming weeks as we see the victory that God gave to Joshua and the victory that God intends for you and me as well. Now, there is, is, a, is a need for us to be battle-tested. There's a need for us to understand what it takes to walk in real victory. And, 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 you know, we, and, and as we meet Joshua, when we first meet Joshua, this warrior, we see him as he is chosen to lead the fight against the Amalekites, a, a people group called the Amalekites in Exodus chapter 17. That's the story when the, the, the two had to hold up Moses' arms you remember? And uh, Moses, as long as Moses' arms were upheld and Moses was praying, everything went well in the battle. But as soon as Moses' arms got tired, the battle began to be lost. And so they came alongside him and they held up, the, held up his arms. And Joshua was the one who was leading the people in that battle. And then we find him standing loyally by the side of Moses as Moses converses with the Lord. And, 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 and as Moses goes up to Mount Sinai, the one who is closest at hand in all of those things that were happening was Joshua. And then, perhaps most famously, we see him as one of the twelve spies who went over into the, the Promised Land. You remember the story? There were twelve spies. Ten of them came back despairing because there were giants in the land. But not Joshua and not Caleb. They said, yes, there are giants in the land. They absolutely assessed it like everybody else did. But the Lord will fight for us. Let's go and take the land. We see Him as in, in, in His faithfulness. And then in Numbers 27, He's singled out by God as the one who would succeed Moses. And the Lord describes Him as one who is filled by the Spirit. And another point, one who is filled with the Spirit of wisdom. Joshua is an amazing character in the Bible. Amazing picture. And it is, it, it is good, isn't it, that, that, that the Lord that the Lord in His wisdom gave Him this name, Yeshua, the same name as the Lord Jesus. The Hebrew derivative of the, the same name of the Lord Jesus. Joshua has been called a type of Jesus in, 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 in many respects. And He is a mighty warrior and who goes to battle and 
leads God's people into battle. Now, from Joshua, we're going to learn how to win. From Joshua, we're going to learn how to win. You know, uh, I, I was a preacher that I was talking with a while back said that he was interviewed recently on a radio uh, on a radio program, and the, the the guy who was interviewing him said. Well, now what you are teaching about is the victorious life, right? The preacher said, no, it's not. That, that's not what I'm, I'm teaching about. And he said, well, then what you're teaching about, uh, it, what, what, what would, would, would you call it the deeper life? And he said, no, that's not really what I'm teaching about. Well, the, the radio interviewer was kind of frustrated with him. He said, said, well, what are you teaching about? And he said, I'm talking about the Christian life. The normal Christian life. Watch me. He wrote a book. I encourage it. It's an old book. It's been around a long time. Called the Normal Christian Life. The normal Christian life is a victorious life. It's not some kind of extraordinary life that a few people live in, but it is the call to every one of us to walk in the victory of the Lord. And many of you are facing insurmountable challenges in your lives right now. And the child, there's a tremendous challenge to the church in our time such that maybe the church in the United States has not experienced in many, many centuries, many years, many decades. And I, and I, I wonder how are we going to do? How are we going to do when we're facing these challenges? Let me just run some things by you to kind of help you to assess how you're doing right now. These are not on your handout, but just, just listen and, 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 and assess as we walk through this. In an increasingly materialistic world, how are you doing with laying up treasures in heaven? Victorious life, there's laying up treasures in heaven. In an increasingly sexually broken world, how are you doing with purity according to the Word of God? In an increasingly angry world, how are you doing with living at peace with even the most difficult people around you? How are you doing with loving your enemies and even doing good to those who may have abused you? I, was, uh, I live right near the little roundabout over in, on Louisville Road and a few days ago, I was there. There was a, a guy in a, in a little car in front of two cars up in front of me, and, and this uh, that instead of do, using the roundabout like you're supposed to, let me give you a lesson here on roundabouts. Okay, your roundabouts are not stop signs. Okay, you 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 go to the roundabout. If there's nobody directly in the lane, you just merge right through. Right. Well, this guy used it as a stop sign. In fact, for people two miles away, I think he was using it for, for a stop sign. This guy had incredible vision. He saw, and, and, and the guy between him and me got, honked his horn. You know, the guy stops, he, he hit his horn. That guy went ballistic. He went absolutely ballistic. I couldn't believe it. He was, he got, he, he didn't get out of the car. I thank God he didn't get out of the car. Cause, but, 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 I mean, you know, all kinds of, uh, Finger pointing and things like that, you know, were going on, and and and, and there's a and, and I, I, we live in, a, in a, an increasingly angry world, don't we? How you doing with living at peace in that kind of world? How are you doing with living at peace with even people who abused you, hurt you? How are you doing in, in, in an increasingly self-centered world? How are you doing with a life of service and missionary focus? I mean, would somebody call you a servant? Would some, is there any evidence in your life of, of missionary focus at, at all? Is there a concern for your neighbor? Is there a reaching out in some way to the people around you? In an increasingly anxious world, how are you doing with living in the peace that passes understanding? Well, we live in an anxious world. In an increasingly lonely world, how are you doing with living at home in Christ and in the body of Christ? In an increasingly bored world, how are you doing with finding your contentment in Christ and not having to seek after more and more and more to entertain you. In an increasingly lying world, how are you doing with telling the truth? 
And in a world that values personal autonomy above everything else, how are you doing with coming under the authority of King Jesus? This is the thing I'm talking about when I'm talking about victory. I'm not talking, not talking about big numbers. I'm not talking about a lot of flash and flare. I'm talking about how you're doing on the inside. And this is what we're talking about when we talk about the victorious Christian life. And the challenge is great, folks. Now, what does a Christian who's going to live in victory need to know? Well, let's, let's look at verse, verse 1. After the death of Moses, that's really important, the servant of the Lord, the Lord said to Joshua, the son of Nun, Moses' assistant, Moses, my servant is dead. Now therefore, arise and go over this Jordan, you and all this people in the land that I'm giving them to the, to the people of Israel. The thing we need, one of the first things we need to know is that God's victory is purposeful. In fact, the purpose of God's victory has not changed throughout the centuries. God is a covenant God. He is a God who calls His people to His purposes. God wanted Joshua to know that Moses is dead, but the purposes of God have not changed. And regardless of what's happening around us, folks, regardless of the, of the change in the culture around us, God's purposes have not changed for His people. And, and, and if we allow ourselves just to merge in with the culture and let the, let the culture set the agenda for our lives, then we lose sight, then we cannot walk in that victory that the Lord has promised to us and desires for you and for me. God's purpose is, is, is or God's victory is purposeful. God set apart for Himself a people. He has done that all the way through history. He did it through Abraham. And we read in, in Genesis chapter 12, He set apart a, a people. And He said, all the nations through you are going to be blessed. God set apart a people. said His name might be proclaimed and His name might be known throughout the earth. And you know who that people is today? You and me. The church. We are the people of God set apart for the purposes of God. Every time I prepare a sermon, I always leave out a passage of Scripture that I wish I'd put in. And here's, here it is, okay? In, in Titus chapter 2, listen, listen to this. He, he gave, speaking of Christ, He gave Himself for us to redeem us from all lawlessness and to purify for Himself a people for His own possession who are zealous for good works. To purify for Himself a people for His own possession. You know what His purpose for Israel was? To be a people for His own possession. To purify a people. That's why all those elaborate laws were given to the children of Israel. That they might be a people who were, who were purified for His purposes. And listen, if you're going to walk in the victory that, that, that the Lord desires for you as, as a follower of Jesus Christ, then you need to understand the purpose of God that you are set apart and that we together are set apart for His purposes that He has sought to purify for Himself a people for His own possession who are zealous for good works. Jesus said on this rock, I will build My kingdom and the gates of hell will not prevail against it. This is God's purpose to set apart a people. I will build My church. That's us. And He will build us for His purposes. Victory is purposeful. If you're going to walk in victory, you need to understand and walk and live in the purposes of God that He has set apart for you and me as His people. And then, verse 3, we read, Every place that the sole of your foot will tread upon, I have given to you. The second thing we need to understand is that victory is a gift. I mean, look at that. Every place that the sole of your foot will tread upon, I have given to you. I give you three passages of Scripture there. I'm going to skip down just to one of them. 1 Corinthians 15, 57. The tech people love it when I do that. 1 Corinthians 15, 57. But thanks be to God who does what? What does it say? It gives us the victory. How? Through our Lord Jesus Christ. 
Listen, for you and for me, victory is a gift. It is not something that somehow we conjure up or we make happen in our lives. It is not something that we gain through some ritualistic process by making ourselves holy, by, by doing certain things and, and, and following through following certain rituals. It is a gift from God. It is not of works lest anyone should boast. It is a gift. And I, as simple as that is, that is so very important for us to understand that victory for the Christian is a gift. God said to Joshua, I'm giving you the land. And you know what He says to you and me? I've given you the victory. I've given you the victory through the Lord Jesus Christ. In His death and burial and resurrection is victory for all who will come to Him. And then we read, and just as these, those amazing words, just as I promised to Moses. And then He tells them the extent of that. The, from the wilderness of Lebanon and the river Euphrates, the land of the Hittites, the great sea toward the going down of the sun shall be your territory. Victory is promised. It is promised. From the beginning of time, God has promised the victory that is yours and mine in Christ Jesus. He has, he, he has set us apart to receive the promises that He gave. You know, God said to Moses in Exodus chapter 6, I will take you to be My people, and I will be your God, and you shall know that I am the Lord your God, who has brought you out from under the burdens of the Egyptians. God speaking through Moses to the people of Israel. Now listen to what He says. Verse 8, I will bring you into the land that I swore to give to Abraham, and Isaac, and to Jacob. You think that's all pretty well rooted? Absolutely. This is not some new thing. This is not some individualized thing. It's not your individual victory. This is the victory of the people of God. And Moses, God is rooting this in history for Moses. He roots it in history for you and for me. And so He says, I, I will give it to you for a possession. The land is so important. We're going to talk about that more in a later sermon. And then He said, I am the Lord. And Moses spoke thus to the people of Israel. But listen to what happened. They did not listen to Moses because of their broken spirit. Our slavery. Listen, folks, we need to hear what the Lord is saying to you and to me, even in this, in this trying, difficult time. We need to hear the Lord say, I am giving you my victory. I have promised it. The only way you can know victory in the Christian life is to feed your soul on the promises of God. The psalmist in one, Psalm 119 says, This is my comfort in my affliction that your promise gives me life. Standing on the promises, we say. Standing on the promises. That might be an old song, but it's an even older truth. That we stand on God's promises and what God cannot lie has already said to you and to me. And then verse 5 says, No man shall be able to stand before you all the days of your life. Just as I was with Moses, so I will be with you. I will not leave you or forsake you. And we need to understand that victory is inseparably linked with the presence of God. If God had a calling card, if God had a, had a card that He handed to every person who comes to Him, it would say, I am with you. Every time God called somebody, I mean, go back and look. Every time He called somebody, it's like, it's like and you know, you say it's almost a broken record. God says it over and over again. I am with you. And don't we take that for granted? I, that very simple truth that in the battles you're facing right now, in the things that you're struggling with right now, in the, in, in, in the need of your life right now, God is saying, I am with you with you. And how desperately we need to know that. And one of the most discouraging things in the world is, is when you think you're fighting those battles all by yourself. And your mind plays tricks on you. 
Sometimes the enemy lays traps for you, and you and, and you forget, and you forget. Simply that simple truth: I am with you. And you say, "Well, that was Joshua. Joshua was an extraordinary person. I mean, he in the he got a book of the Bible named after him." In the say, but 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 listen, listen. Look at what the Lord says, Hebrews chapter thirteen. To people just like you and to me, keep your life free from the love of money and be content with what you have. For He has said, "I will never leave you nor forsake you." So we can confidently say, "The Lord is my help; I will not fear." Whatever you're facing, whatever you're struggling with today, you can confidently say, "The Lord." My helper, I will not fear. What can man do to me? Jesus said, the last thing He said before He ascended to heaven, and, and behold, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. This past Friday night, we uh, Beth and I kept the little twins, our little twin grandchildren, overnight for the first time. I, I think it was the first time they'd been away from their parents overnight. To, and, and so, you know, when they lay down, I sacrificed and said, "Oh, I'll just lay down with them." You know, and uh, I, I'm laying there between them, and and uh, you know, one of them drifts off to sleep very quickly, but the other one is sitting there. He's kind of talking to himself, and he's, he's he, uh, he just he's kind of reassuring himself. He's, he says, "And Daddy's at work, but he'll come home soon, and we'll see Mommy soon." He just—he wasn't talking to me. He was just talking out loud. He was just—and and, and then he reached over, and touched me, to be sure I was still there. Aren't you glad this morning that you can be sure the Lord is still there? I mean, as simple as that truth is, what a, a life-changing truth it is to know that the Lord is is with us. And that our battles, we do not fight on our own. This, this, and, and this, yes, this is a specific promise to Joshua, but this is a promise to all of us as the people of God. I am with you. You are not going to fight this battle alone. Moses might be dead, God was saying, but I'm not dead. I am with you. And so he says. Be strong and courageous, for you shall cause this people to inherit the land that I swore to their fathers to give them. Now I'm going to say something here that, yeah, that, 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 that almost sounds contradictory. Victory that is given must be gotten. We need to understand that the victory that is given must be gotten. It almost seems contradictory. But, but listen, yes, victory in the Christian life is a gift, but it is a gift that we must be willing to receive. I mean, can you imagine somebody going out here and going back to the water fountain back there, and, and, and you know they, they kneel in front of that water fountain and they just start praying, oh, water fountain, please give me water. For one thing, we'd cart them off and we'd take them to a nice, safe place. But that, I mean, that's just as ridiculous as us standing before the Lord. Oh, God, give me victory. But then not moving on the victory that He's called us to. God, look, look at what it says. God, God said, For you shall, Joshua, you shall cause this people to inherit the land that I swore to their fathers to give them. I thought it was a gift. Yes, it is. But it's a gift that must be gotten. You know, one of the most puzzling passages of Scripture, if you don't understand this, in the, in, in, in the New Testament, it's Philippians chapter 2, verses 12 and 13. And it says, work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. Which sounds like you work for your salvation. But then verse 13 says, for it is God who works in you both to will and to work for His good pleasure. We are not passive in this. Yes, we are, we are saved by, by grace, but, but grace through faith it is, it is a gift from God and, and we must receive the gift, right? We must simply receive the gift. But we must receive. Victory that is given must be gotten. And how do we get it? Well, verse 7, only be strong and very courageous. Victory is gotten through faith. It is gotten through faith. 
God commands him, be strong and be very courageous. We don't go out to victory. We go out from victory. But we do go out. And we need to understand that as we, as, as we walk with the Lord, God's not just going to, not, God's not just going to confer on you something that you're not willing to receive and be an active participant in. You don't get saved by your participation, but you are saved to participation. You don't, you, you don't go out to get salvation, but out of your salvation you go out. And so we exercise faith. Faith, victory is gotten through faith. And then we read, being careful to do according to all the law that Moses, my servant, commanded you. Do not turn from it to the right or to the left, that you may have good success wherever you go. This book of the law shall not depart from your mouth, but you shall meditate on it day and night so that you may be careful to do according to all that is written in it. For then you will make your way prosperous, and then you will have good success. Victory is gotten through faith, and victory is gotten through obedience. Listen, to one of the great fallacies of culturized Christianity that many of us grew up in is that you can... You, you can Say, I'm a, I'm a Christian, and just kind of go on about your life however you choose in whatever way you decide you would like to, to live your life and, 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 and not bring your life under obedience. The blessing of the Christian life comes from obedience. The pathway to blessing is obedience. Victory is gotten through obedience. God says to, to Joshua that do, do not turn from this word to the right or to the left that you may have good success wherever you go. The book of the law shall not depart from your mouth. You shall meditate on it that you may be careful to do according to all that is written. Joshua, you're focused so much on it. It's, been, it's to be like anybody ever had one of those tunes that you just couldn't get out of your head? heard the tune. That's how the Word of God is supposed to be in our lives every day. This, this, this tune played over and over and over as we meditate on it. And meditation is to have the effect of, of leading us to do all that the Lord has given us to do. The law brings us to wisdom and to the right way of living. In, in, Psalm, chapter, in Psalm 119 we read, Incline my ear to your testimonies and not to selfish gain. Turn my eyes from looking at worthless things and give me life in your ways. This is what God was saying to Joshua. You fast forward down to verse 99 in Psalm 119. I have more understanding than all my teachers for your testimonies are my meditation. I understand more than the aged for I keep your precepts. This is the impact that the Word of God is to have upon our lives. How many of you, I know this sounds like a random question, how many of you like garlic? Yeah, we know you like garlic. Yeah, it, I mean, garlic is one of those things that just has that effect, right? It, you take it in and it just exudes out, right? Yeah, and, and you know what? This is, this is what the Word of God is to do in our life. I don't know if that's a good illustration, you know? But then compare the Word of God to garlic. It's strong. <laughs> okay, and, 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 and it just, when, when you take it in, when somebody takes it in, you know it know it. And the transformation begins to work its way out in our lives. And this is what God has, said, has told Joshua. Don't, you know, don't turn from the right to the right or to the left. Stay straight on in what the Word has told you to do. Live it out in day to day, moment by moment, obedience. And you will have success. And you will prosper. Please don't make that into some kind of prosperity gospel thing. You will have success even in the darkest moments. Even in the most difficult moments. 
It's not going to mean your, your, your pathway is, is free of obstacles and difficulties. It means that your pathway is going to have obstacles and difficulties, but you're going to have confidence and you're going to be prosperous and successful even in the midst of all of that. And it's going to cost you something. It's not going to be culturized Christianity where you just sort of merge in. It's going to be the kind. It's going to be Christianity that, that requires of you more than you've got to give. And the only way you're going to live it out is by walking in Him and walking in His Word day in and day out. Now we come to the end of all this, and it says, verse nine: Have I not commanded you? God said, Have I not commanded you? Be strong and courageous. Do not be frightened. Do not be dismayed, for the Lord your God is with you wherever you go. He repeats Himself. I don't know about you, but I need the Lord to repeat Himself sometimes. Now listen to what happens. And Joshua commanded the officers of the people, pass through the midst of the camp, command the people, prepare your provisions. For within three days, you are to pass over this Jordan to go in to take possession Go in to take possession of the land and the Lord, that the Lord your God is giving you to possess. What Joshua heard from the Lord, he said to the people. And in confidence, the people are going to rise up and we're going to see them to go. Go in and take possession of the land. Folks, God has called us to a victorious Christian life. To not wander around in the wilderness anymore. It's time to cross over. And it's time to go into the land that He has given to us. That the Jordan, that the land beyond the Jordan is not heaven. The land beyond the Jordan has all kinds of pitfalls and all kinds of difficulties, and there are enemies there, and there's going to be sin there, and there's going to be temptation and struggle there. That's not heaven. You have been called to go into the land, to possess the land. And that's not an extraordinary Christian life. That's the ordinary Christian life. A life of victory. Thanks be to God who gives us the victory through our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. You know, three out of the first six books of the Bible end with the death. Genesis ends with Joseph died. Deuteronomy ends with Moses dying. And Joshua's going to end with Joshua dying. But there are four books of the Bible where the, 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 main, the, the, the main focus of those books, at the end of those books, there's not a death, but there's a resurrection. Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. There's a resurrection. And you know what? Because of that, the very last book of the Bible ends not with death for those who belong to the Lord, but with life eternal for those who belong to the Lord. That 